And we don't have anybody yet that has signed up to um, speak to the public hearings. Okay, you're live. Right. And we don't have any. Okay, we'll call the uh, meeting to order for the city of Saratoga Springs. Uh, City Council tonight on Tuesday, May 5th, uh, 2020 at uh, 6.02 p.m. Um, we are conducting this meeting all electronically as per the state and federal guidelines concerning COVID-19. Uh, present tonight, we have Councilman Porter, Councilman McComber, Councilman Wilden, Councilman Karn, and Councilman Pedescas. We do have a quorum. Um, I've asked Councilman Wilden to lead us in our invocation and Councilman McComber to lead us in our pledge. Prayer first, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful that we're able to be gathered as leaders of the community virtually this evening, and we're grateful that we're able to be able to look and evaluate decisions to improve the welfare of our neighbors and family and residents of the city. And we ask you to bless our the city staff and all the residents and all those throughout the world that they'll be able to be healthy and recover from this virus and they'll be able to help one another and eh, look out for one another. And these things we say in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, everyone, please rise. Repeat the pledge after me. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Hey, reports from the council, from anybody on the council with a report? Okay, Mark, anything from administration? We do. Uh, I'm going to have Owen give you a quick update, but Mayor and Council, uh, we're responding as we've discussed in the past, to COVID. Um, we don't have any significant issues to report uh, regarding that. Um, we do have some, um, you know, um, things that we're going to be working with, and, and we'll update you as, as we get more information. Still waiting to find out from Utah County as to how they're going to disperse the county uh, the funds that were distributed to the county um, and hopefully they'll distribute those to us as cities but we'll give you an update on that in our next meeting if we've got more information and then owen if you could give the council an update relative to the uh, uh, public private partnership uh, conversation that we'd had last meeting yeah mayor council uh as uh, i communicated with you we spoke with the group that met with us last time and expressed the uh the stance that right now isn't the time for us to enter into such a partnership due to financial and other reasons. Um, Express, we would still love to have them in the city. Um, we would be happy to work with them if they choose to move forward with an application. It does sound like they want to do a public partner, public private partnership instead of uh, go on their own. So it sounds like they're looking with some other cities to see if they can get some interest there, but uh, did not close the door completely. We'll still talk with them, um, but just now wasn't the time for us to move forward. And so uh, just kind of an update with that uh, communication to them. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Well, first uh, public hearing, fiscal year 2020 2021 budget resolution R20. Public hearing item one. Oh, there you go. Is so, it uh, time for public comment or is it me first? It's you first. Okay. Um, and this is, we have two items up. Is this the budget amendment or the? The item one, fiscal year 2020 budget resolution. Okay. Oh, never mind. We got to continue to June 16th. 
Well, Mayor, we would like to do a quick discussion. Uh, we don't. Uh, we do have a couple of attendees if they would like to give public comment. We just we we're not going to take formal action on the item tonight. So our recommended action would be do the public hearing and then take the um, then then take action on this uh, in our second meeting in June. Okay. It's your show, Justin. Let's do uh, the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget. Okay, like Mark, Mark mentioned, this is just a continuation of the tentative budget that was approved. Um, we are recommending that it um, be continued in uh, the June 16th meeting. Um, it's the same information you guys have seen before. We're just using all the time we have available um, to make adjustments to it um, as we better understand the financial impacts from the COVID-19 impact. And so it's there and it's open for uh, public comment if there is any, but at this time, we don't recommend you take any action on it until the meeting on June 16th. Okay. David, do we have any public comment? So we'll open up for public comment at this time. Mayor, um, there's no one, uh, no one that is signed up for the public comment and no attendees. The, the only attendees that we have at this time are to speak to um, one of the items later. Okay, perfect. Okay, then I will close the public hearing for the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget. Um, Mark, you said we needed a motion just to carry it to the 16th or we're good to go as is? Uh, we're, we're good to go. We'll just um, have another public hearing uh, in June as we get a little bit closer. So again, this is just um, just continuing the item until uh, until June 9th. Uh, was it June 16th? I can't remember which date it was. June 9th. Okay. June 16th. 16th. Thank you. Okay. Um, public hearing item two, the sixth budget amendment for the fiscal year 2019-2020 resolution R20-20. Okay, back with you. Um, this is our sixth budget amendment of the fiscal year. Um, we had to make some adjustments for some things that came our way. Our fire department received a, a, a grant from the state, so we had to account for that. Um, we're getting ready um, for the, the ladder truck purchase, and so we've created the line items necessary to facilitate that. Um, Jeremy um, had to make some adjustments to some capital project line items. Um, and so the information was provided there in the packet. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to respond to those. Any questions? <clears throat> okay, we'll open up for public hearing. Is there any public comment for this item? There's, there's no one in attendance okay. for public comment. Perfect, okay. Well, I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion. May I move that we approve the sixth budget amendment for fiscal year 2019-2020 resolution R 2020 dated 5-5-20. All second. Okay, I have a first from uh, Councilman Karn, a second from Councilman McComber. Any further discussion? Roll call, Porter? Aye. McComber? Aye. Wilden? Aye. Karn? Aye. Tedesca? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. We'll move on to the business items. Um, just in case anybody's here for business item six, it is being uh, postponed at the applicant's request um, to a future date. So we will not have item six on here tonight. The Saratoga Springs Commercial Plat E, preliminary plat, um, Daniel Smith, the applicant, that's the ABC. Um, it is being uh, postponed at their request. So we'll go to business item one, fiscal year, 2019 2020 third quarter financial update mayor city council um i'm just here for the third quarter so this is through march 31st uh 2020 um i'm going to address the two items that are in red in the kri first and um, if you look at there the building fees are down by a few thousand dollars um over the course of the multiple year and then a little under two thousand for or multi-year, a little under 2,000, and for um, prior year, it's almost 5,000. Um, this actual um, revenue source um, compromises of two line items, and one of them is the state surcharge, and the other one is the basement permit fees. 
So these items are pretty nominal on a, on a normal basis, but um, from what I understand after talking to Angela today, um, the state used to only take 80% of that revenue and now they're taking 85%. So that's probably the reason why it is down. And they started the 85% about two years. And on the other charges that comprises of um, some of the smaller, smaller revenue sources and other charges, but the big one is the wildland revenue. And we have not deployed at all this year for our fire department. So that's the reason why that has um, no revenue coming in for the wildland. Um, other than that, on um, our actual uh, third quarter budget analysis, the three um, departments that are showing um, yellow are the legislative, the treasurer, and the non-departmental. And most of those are because of um, a lot of our fees and memberships are paid up front in the fiscal year. So it doesn't kind of get spread out until the end of the year, but they're all looking like on target for, for pre, as of previous years. And then of course the treasurer is the bank charges. More and more people, especially now are using credit cards over checks and, and everything else. So is there any questions concerning the third quarter financial update? Yeah. Seeing none, thank you, Chelsea, for doing that. Sure. Hey, Mayor. Yeah. I don't have any questions, but just going through that, I just had some general comments that this is, uh, I'm very grateful that we have a city staff and everything that's been done to be in such a good financial condition. Um, we could make, you know, with the, the state potential cuts uh, or reduction in sales tax from the state enterprise, or sorry, statewide, I got to switch from my work to city. But we'll potentially see a large reduction in sales tax, but we've been very conservative as a city for at least, what, the last 10 years since Mayor Miller and McCom Council Member McComber were on the city council and I was on the finance committee. And I just think we're in a really good position in the city as a city and we can absorb what we're doing quite well for quite a while. And some people have been critical of us being as conservative as we are on the budgeting in the past. I'm glad that we've been very conservative because it puts us in a really good position as a city and, and being in the financial uh, industry, Utah's pretty strong, but my company holds a lot of bonds in other states and other, uh, other municipalities and our city is in a really good place. So I, I appreciate everything staff's done and everyone else to really take us where we were, I think it was 10 years ago or 12, whatever it was, to where we are now. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Item two, 2020 drinking water uh, AMI customer engagement contract award. Yeah, so Mayor and Council, um, that's an item that I was helping oversee. Um, before I jump into that, though, Mayor, I just wanted to, um, there's a couple of, there's an attendee, some attendees raising their hands. It's just a reminder that the public hearing items are now closed and there are no more items with uh, open to public comment. So um, just wanted to make um, the public aware of that. Um, so with the AMI drinking water, this was related to a grant received from um, the Central Utah Water Conservancy District to um, go toward uh, creating customer engagement for um, our new metering system. Well, not the metering system, related to the metering system and the customer portal that gives our customers real-time data related to um, their water usage. Uh, and so what this grant goes towards, it's a 50-50 match and it'll go towards uh, working with a hired public relations firm with myself and with um, Public Works to um, better inform the public about the customer portal and try to further reduce water usage um, and have, be more conservation minded so that people can find and set alerts that if they have a leak in their home, it'll send them an alert immediately um, based on the types of alerts that they set. Uh, and so basically what this is doing is um, we reviewed, I think, five or six um, RFPs and as a committee, an um, internal staff committee, um, we unanimously 
um, decided to go with uh, Langdon as our recommendation to extend the contract to for these services. Okay, any comments or questions from the council? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I move that we approve the 2020 Drinking Water Customer Engagement Contract Award, awarding it to the Langdon Group, resolution R20-21 dated today. Okay, uh, first from Councilman Porter. I'll second. Second from Councilman Wilden. Any further discussion on the motion? Councilman Karn? Aye. McConder? Aye. Porter? Aye. Tedesca? Aye. Wilden? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. We have the second amendment uh, interlocal agreement for joint and cooperative action of Central Utah 911. Resolution R20-22. Sorry, trying to get to my mute button. Mayor and Council, um, basically what this resolution is doing is it's basically making it so that people as they join the 911 dispatch board can be allowed to be on the, the, the central committee. So uh, we've had Juab County that joined about a year ago. Um, we've got uh, Pleasant Grove that just joined just a few months ago. And so in essence, what this, uh, what this action or this uh, agree, uh, interlocal agreement will allow for us to do is to be able to add those members when they join the district so that they then have uh, privileges as, as being a member of the district. So um, it's, it's really just an adjustment to the bylaws to make sure that we can add these people as they join. Again, the goal is, is to try and get uh, all of the dispatch agencies consolidated where the communities want to participate and become part of that agency. So um, we think that this is a, a good thing for us as a district. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, if there's no questions, I'll entertain a motion. I'll move that we approve business item three, resolution R20-22 data today. Second. I have a first from Councilman Wilden, a second from Councilman McComber. Any further discussion on the motion? Oh, that was Podeska. Oh, Podeska, sorry. Michael screen's the one that lit up for me. <laughs> okay, roll call. Porter? Aye. Wilden? Aye. Podeska? Aye. Karn? Aye. McComber? You're on mute. Now you're on mute. And I. Perfect. <laughs> okay, um, item four. Amendment to the Utah County County Communities that Care Interlocal Agreement, Resolution R20-23. David Johnson. Yeah, Mayor, that um, that item. So the the county um, receives additional funding when they get um, new CTC programs um, and and other things. They get ten thousand dollars of additional funding. Um, the county. Um, wasn't going to be able to use it for some of the, uh, I guess, intended in, intended uses. And so therefore, um, they asked our CTC program if we could utilize those funds. Um, and so Karen put in a list with the county of things that she could um, utilize those funds for. And so we will receive $10,000 that we have to spend within the next two months. Um, but they can be for supplies and items that we can save for the upcoming year as well. So this is not a renewal of the, um, I'm sorry, my video wasn't on. This is not a renewal of the a contract that'll be coming up in, in about a month or two. Um, this is just an amendment to the current contract for the remaining two months of the, of the fiscal year. Okay. If there's no uh, questions. Yeah, I have, I have a question. Oh, perfect. So, um, uh, David, in uh, anticipation for that new contract coming up, not to get into any personnel discussions, but is there any way that, because um, I'm, I'm a huge support of, of kind of their mission of what they're doing, mm -hmm. but as far as having something built into the contract that um, certain, I don't know, reporting is happening to kind of yes. see like the effectiveness of the program, what they're yes. doing to, to find out what, how it's going? Yeah, that I've actually had some very thorough conversations with the county um, uh, of specifically the criteria and expectations, both from the program, um, from the coordinator running the program. 
I've had similar conversations with Eagle Mountain since it's a joint contract also with Eagle Mountain. Um, and we will be spelling out in the contract what the expectations are, um, because I, I feel like some of that has been missing. Um, and, it's, and it's hard to determine the effectiveness of the program, what the ROI is for the city without spelling out s some of the, the um, you know, requirements or what we want to see happen with the program. And the county was all in support of that. So was Eagle Mountain. Um, so we've written all of those kind of ideas down. The county's putting together a draft. Before we finalize that draft or bring it to you, we'll take it to our CTC <laughs> coordinator to you know, make sure that she feels good and comfortable with everything spelled in there, that they're reasonable expectations. Um, and then once we have that, we'll, we'll bring it uh, to, to the council for, uh, for renewal. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I just don't wanna be, uh, I'm, I'm fine with putting the money towards programs like that, um, just not blindly. Uh, I'd like to kind of see what the effectiveness is and what can be done better type of thing. Agreed. Thanks. Okay, any other comments? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I move to amend uh, the Utah community, uh, Utah County Communities That Care uh, Interlocal Local Agreement <laughs> Resolution R20-23 dated today. Uh, first from Council Move Podesca. I'll second. I'll second. Yeah, second Council Move Porter. We'll do any further discussion on the motion. Uh, Councilman Karn. Aye. McComber. Aye. Tedesca? Aye. Wilden? Aye. Porter? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Item five, update to parks, trails, recreation, and open space master plan, ordinance 20-17. Yes, um, Mayor, I, uh, I'm right now I'm uh, promoting our panel, or I'm sorry, our, our consultant, um, um, landmark uh, to I'm promoting them to be I'm sorry um, panelists so that they can speak so Lisa and and Mark if you're available um, Lisa will be presenting on this um, this update to the parks trails open space master plan um, that we've been working on so I will turn the time over to Lisa okay thanks David um, I'm not sure if Mark has been able to join online he is on. okay, Mark. If you want to chime in, you'll just need to unmute your microphone. It looks like. Um, otherwise, we'll get started. Um, can everyone see my screen yes. presentation? Yes. Great. Yes. yes. Okay. So thank you for the opportunity to go over the draft plan with you tonight. Um, some of this you've already seen, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on some of this. Um, Again, this was an update to your previous uh, parks and recreation master plan. Um, you know, we cover parks and rec, um, recreation, or parks and open space, uh, recreation, community events, and the arts, trails, and then we also look at your priorities and costs and establish goals and policies for the future. Um, we had uh, a significant amount of public input throughout the process, you know, a statistically valid survey, public meetings. Um, website interfaces, um, online map commenting tools, that sort of thing. Um, this slide just summarizes some of the results of the survey. Uh, again, um, you know, top priorities of residents are the recreation center pool, lakefront beach, walking and biking trails. Um, residents use parks that are close to home most often. Um, most needed types of parks or recreation facilities include the rec center, splash pad, lakefront beach, and specialty parks like dog parks and skate parks. Um, just under half of your residents participated in recreation programs last year, and um, <clears throat> quite a, num a large number of your residents used the trails at least a few times a year, and um, only just over 11% of the residents are dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with the city's um, provision of parks, recreation, and trails. So overall, you guys have a really high rating. Um, and then you can see the summary of willingness to pay. Uh, overall, residents are generally satisfied with your existing facilities and parks. They're, they're more willing to pay for uh, new facilities than they are to upgrade um, or improve existing facilities. And then you can see the dollar amount, 139 per year that they're willing to pay on average to help fund the recreation center. Lisa. Mayor, 
Yeah. Councilman McComber. Thank you. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, I don't know if I missed it in the packet or in here, but what was the response rate? Like how many people are we talking that are willing to pay 139 a year? How many responses are we talking? <clears throat> this survey had over 2000 respondents. Yeah. And I was gonna add to the 139 a year is how much they would be willing to pay, not in membership fees, but in uh, you know, related to, you know, taxes, taxes. Yes, taxes. exactly. So 2000, you're talking about 10%, little, little less than 10%. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And the full survey results are available in the appendix of the document. If you want to take a look and dive into any questions. In so what number is needed in a survey like that for statistics? Statistical validity. Over 400. Um, yeah, around 400 is what we shoot for. Your margin of error gets better the higher number of responses you have. That's to Dave, to your, maybe your inquiry. Yeah, I just wanted the, the council to, to know that and mm -hmm. I couldn't remember off the top of my head. So I wanted yeah. to So a 2000 margin of error is probably plus or minus around one and a half percent, I would imagine 2%, but that's just, not having a calculator and doing that, but just from experience. Mm -hmm. um, so this slide summarizes uh, the social pinpoint input. This was an online engagement tool that we uh, just started using with this project. We had never used it before. So you guys were um, get a guinea pig on this and it let people you know, drag and drop pins to specific locations on the, around the city and, and give us comments and leave they could leave photos if they wanted to and provide links to additional information. Um, again, all the full details of those comments are available in the appendix. Um, and there was you know, just a wide variety of topics and concerns that uh, came out of that process. And we had um, almost 700 people log into that process um, with almost 90 specific comments left. So chapter one provides a bit of background on the city, um, which feeds into all of the parks and recreation needs assessments. Uh, demographics, your growth rate, you're, you're um, going to nearly triple by 2060 in build out, um, going from uh, just under 40,000 today to over 100,000 in 2060. Overall, your population is younger than the county, state, and nation. Uh, you have more children under 18 in households than the county, state, and nation. Um, you're getting younger, which is atypical of most communities along the Wasatch Front. Uh, most communities tend to be gradually aging, but your, your population is getting younger right now and your household size is actually increasing, which is actually pretty unique um, in the Wasatch Front as well. Um, diving into parks, you have over 300 acres of parklands that serve the city um, and you have 27 city owned parks and over 80 acres of existing open space. This map shows the existing parks within the city and um, part of the plan we also document all the individual amenities within each of those facilities so if you want to dive into any details on the facilities that is available as well. Uh, the city has four types of parks, uh, pocket parks, neighborhood parks, community parks, and regional parks, obviously with regional parks being the largest. Um, altogether, you have um, 136.9 acres that contribute to your park area ratio. And again, when we're doing some of these analyses, we exclude uh, land that's owned by the school district or other communities or special use parks like the mountain bike, uh, the mountain bike, Trail Park or the RC Airplane Park, just because they fill really specific needs and don't necessarily contribute to overall um, kind of a park service level. Um, we also don't include uh, private parks in this calculation. So looking at your park area ratio, this is um, a ratio of your park acreage um, to your current population and it's um, done per thousand people. So right now you guys have 3.72 acres per 1,000 people of existing parks in the city. What's considered a good number for that? Um, that's a really relative uh, um, and suggest, subjective kind of 
figure. Uh, some communities, well, I should start out by saying that not all communities calculate this number in the same way. Um, I can tell you that the projects that we've done, we calculate them in the same way. So referencing some of those cities, um, it's more of an apples to apples comparison. Um, there are communities that add in, for example, if they own a lot of land up an adjacent canyon or something, they'll add that in just to kind of bump this number up. So this number is more, it's more for an internal evaluation purposes, like to see where you're at now and target where you want to be in the future. Um, you can look at other communities for reference purposes, but, um, you know, for example, Lehigh, you know, they wanted to really uh, become a parks and recreation destination. And so they've tried to push their number up quite a bit for the future, but it's, it's more common for communities to have a lower um, park area ratio as they develop and mature, um, just because you have other you know, you have a, a significantly significantly increasing population, and you also have other lands that play into meeting your parks and recreation needs, like open space um, and just other specialty facilities that can help meet needs that aren't necessarily traditional parks. Thanks. Um, this, this is Mark. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'd just like to add that I think that the, that number is maybe average to a little bit above average. Uh, we, we see when you get up in the fives and above, that's a lot, but like Lisa said, it just depends so much about your, also your community. If you have a lot of open space around it, that it, our, our Western cities are really hard to calculate. I think in general, we have uh, lower overall park area ratios compared to uh, park systems elsewhere in the country where they don't have access to public land. And so that sort of compensates for some of it. Another example, more locally, might be Orem that has no direct access to public land, and so that their their ratio is a little bit. It, they have to take that into consideration that they don't have a canyon or a, a drainage or something that provides some level of recreation. So it's like it, we just use it to get a, a, a sense. You're you're growing and you're growing rapidly, so. I think the challenge is going to be, can you maintain that as you almost, you know, you're going to increase two and a half times in size. Well, to in that population. point, I, I think when I first moved into the city, we were the city council before I was on city council, um, city council was reviewing this. And I think our level of service was that I, I may be off on the exact figure, but it was right around 4.07 is mm -hmm. the number that sticks in my head anyway. Uh, but it was right around four. Um, and so I think the fact that we've now doubled and then some, and we've been able to maintain mm -hmm. a, a consistent level of service, I think is, is uh, I mean, and we've had to purchase Patriot Park and several other parks in order to do that, but. And this doesn't take into consideration, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, um, parks that are existing in HOAs. Correct. Yeah. I think uh, I'm sorry. I don't. I don't see uh, Mark, the the Mark presenting Mark's uh, last name. But um, to his point, we have the lake. Uh, we have um, we have you know Lake Mountain. We have uh, Five Mile Pass and BLM land around that that a lot of people take advantage of. That doesn't count towards that number. Right. So you're 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 fortunate. Uh, I think. Very, very much so. So one of the other analyses that we do is called the distribution analysis, where we look at um, the location of parks within the city and we assign a service area um, radius based on the park size. So pocket parks have a quarter mile service radius, uh, neighborhood parks have a half mile and regional and community parks we set at a mile. And according to this analysis, there are three uh, gaps in the city at present. Um, this shows the distribution and where you can see that brighter yellow in the middle is where you have residential uses that are outside of um, the service areas of existing parks. Um, and obviously some of the challenge with filling these gaps is that um, 
you know, these areas are built out. So adding facilities within these areas, you know, generally, you know, that it generally isn't possible. Um, so we looked to other ways to fill these gaps. You can see those gaps are highlighted in red on this map. So looking to fill the gaps in these areas, um, it, filling gap one, you have, in these cases, often you have to turn to those other sources and see how those needs can be met through things like private parks or maybe public open space or access to trailheads. Um, so in gap area one, um, there are private parks and open space in that area. And then also um, if SITLA moves forward with their um, potential community park they've been talking about on their nearby land, then that would help fill that gap. Um, gap two would be um, met through private open space, uh, lake access, and then access to regional trails. And then gap three, um, the, that area could be served by uh, the development of Performance Park. This map shows the existing and future um, parks and distribution areas, just showing where uh, additional parks need, need to be added throughout the city to help cover those gap areas, um, including future development, future residential areas. So looking at your, your park area ratio for the future, since your residents are happy with the level of service that they're receiving right now, um, we're recommending that you just carry forward that 3.72 acres um, at this point in time. Like I said, that, that number could actually drop over time or if the city decided to change its goals, you could you could um, shoot for a higher service level at any point. This is just kind of a point of reference for planning purposes and, and budgeting purposes, just to see what you need to do to maintain your level of service or your, your park area ratio as your population grows. And just to clarify, the park area ratio is based on acreage, not on the quality of the amenities at that park, correct? Exactly. Um, the amenities we address in the park standards, which is kind of a separate. Sure. Yeah. But this, this yeah. whole, all of this here is, is all about just the space, the amount of space that we've allocated for parks. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. And you guys have um, uh, approaches in your ordinances built in that deal with the amenities and the quality of this. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, looking at needs out to 3030 in the next 10 years. So you have a total need of 209.7 for your projected population in 2030. You have, when we back out the um, existing park acreage that you already have, the park acres that are needed to fill those gaps, um, you're left with a need to acquire and develop 41.8 acres of parkland by 2030. And then if we look at 2060, um, that need between 2030 and 2060 is 189.9 acres. Uh, could Mark or somebody, could you remind me how much acreage is left on Patriot Park project? Uh, Patriot Park would add about an additional 50 acres, 45 acres. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so again, um, like for example, um, as we were talking about just a moment ago, like Performance Park, when that comes in, I, I believe Performance Park is, I want to say nine or something like that, a nine acre park. Again, we'll get that donated to the city once uh, they reach the certain number of building permits issued in Fox Hollow, so that should close that gap. But, but Patriot Park is an additional 45 acres, and then obviously our, our plans are working as, as was said, so um, I hope I tackled your question. No, what no, about the, the North Marina? Yeah, the North Marina and Inlet Park, or is that already being counted or? Let's see, North Marina, I'll have to. I don't think that was included in this when I was looking at it, but. Let's see, um, we have the South Expansion. Is, does the North Marina have public access yet or is it still locked? I don't, well, I don't think you could put a, Boat in the water, even if you no, but there. just even access the grass, just yeah. to even walk in there. Yeah, we we do know. have it closed right now. Again, right, so we can't count it if it's closed. Not as no. open, but as a future. Yeah, yeah. 
But to that point, and, and I think it's a good one, as soon as we do get uh, get that park opened, it will fill that gap. So I think Lisa's right in kind of pointing to that area. Um, but, but at the same time, I think that gets resolved here fairly quickly. And it's 21 acres, it looks like, for Performance Park that filled that gap three. Yeah, this, this chart shows um, kind of what we're looking at acreage wise to fill those gaps and then also some of the planned and proposed parks that were shown on that map that can help meet those needs. Um, you know, if we need to make any adjustments to this table, definitely let us know. Um, but use, using the, these calculations, you would end up with nine acres of surplus potential parkland by build out if all of these proposed parks and facilities were built. I think the only one that I really see it would be like the North Marina and Inlet Park, the hot hot springs, all that area right around um, City Hall, and that we had those meetings on mm -hmm. last year. Okay. Yeah, good point, Chris. The Inlet Park only counts the to the bathroom. They don't count all the other land that's behind the fence. Yet. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of trails and stuff that I mean, it won't be necessarily a developed park with turf but it, it'll be a lot of uh, walking area and nature nature area connected to the trail system yeah yeah and we can decide if um you know how much of that might get designated as open space versus parkland so we can update update that accordingly however you guys want us to do that great and in that area, I mean, like, for example, when you look at Patriot Park expansion, you see 61.9. Again, we're under contract for about 45 acres, but you've got to remember Oakwood's going to be bringing in some open space and some trails as well along the western side of the Jordan River that will kind of help fill in some of those gaps as well. And I think it will easily get us up to that 61.9 number in Patriot Park area. Hey, Mark, would the other developed proposed parks, would Beacon Point fall into that? Oh, sure. I mean, there, there's, I mean, as new development happens, you know, when, when they kind of hit that critical mass of does it make sense for them to pay into existing systems or build a new park, those are going to be what you as a counselor are going to make, and those will be part of their applications and those land use decisions. So, again, like the Beacon Point Park, um, we don't have that in this chart, but that would be another 20 acres that would be added to this as well, or it would be meeting the other developer proposed park needs. It might, it might be interesting to, you know, as those kinds of things come up that we, uh, you know, if staff could, you know, remind us of this 121 number so we can see our progress towards hitting that as we, you know, as I forget what their found, founders park or whatever they're calling it and Beacon point comes online you know we can we can measure that progress because it's, it's great to have a number oh we need to get to 271 but if we're not keeping track of what we're doing to get there and we get to 2060 and we're like oh so uh where's that 271 acres of parks and nobody knows so i think you know just keep track of of when we add something to this list so we know what we're doing to make progress nope that's a great point and we'll work with lisa get a little spreadsheet that we can keep and track in-house on these kinds of things so thank you yeah, like for example, reducing the 121 by the whatever beacon point, because I think that's probably a developer proposed park requirement, but that would be great to be able to keep a tally on that. Thank you. Mayor, yeah. I was going to mention as well, this is Kevin Thurman. Mount Saratoga has got a significant amount of open space that the city will inherit eventually. If we're you know, listing all the areas that will come in the future, shortly in the future. That's yeah, one. I believe it was like 200 acres, but a lot of that, again, is going to be similar to Inlet Park. It's going to be trails through native Atlas, open space native yeah. April, rather than uh, manicured parks. But they do have a significant number of parks as well. Yeah, so I would also I would recommend as um, you move forward, um, you know, maybe tracking your your acreage, but also be sure to keep track of your distribution and make sure that you know you're helping, meet, you know, meet the needs of the residents throughout the city so that they have where the holes where those holes were you talked about yeah yeah exactly, and um, let's see like I said so this map shows a, a lot of proposed parks um, you know up towards the foothills up towards Lake Mountain. Um, 
you know, in other locations in the city, not just filling existing gaps, but what, where future gaps will fall. So, you know, track, maybe track this map as well as you move into the future. Uh, so the, the plan does establish uh, basic park standards for all four park types. Um, these aren't meant to be prescriptive. It's just to give you a baseline of the minimum facilities that should be in each park. You know, like I said, you guys have your other um, ordinances that address amenities and, and kind of the recreation value of your parks and open spaces. So this is just kind of a baseline for all of that. Um, I wanna mention neighborhood parks. Uh, they're generally three to 10 acres, but this plan is recommending that um, the city shoot for five acres minimum just to maintain the most efficiency with park maintenance. And so you're not trying to maintain a bunch of smaller parks throughout the city. Um, and then on community parks and regional parks, I want to point out that uh, community event infrastructure is included on this just because the importance of the public events that you guys have, the community events, and making sure that as, as parks are constructed, um, that you have the in infrastructure in place to make those um, events possible. So looking at the individual amenities within parks, we look at it a couple of different ways. Um, we start out with a ratio of how many amenities you have per population. And uh, we look at the National Recreation Parks Association or kind of initial ideas about what that ratio might be, but then we adjust it for um, communities along the Wasatch Front and your city in particular, just knowing what your needs are and talking with your parks and recreation staff about what these numbers should be at and what we should target. So these numbers come out of direct discussions with your staff and they show um, a need for four multi-purpose fields, um, one sand volleyball court, and then a skate or bike park and a splash pad or water feature. So you're doing, you're doing okay on the other amenities right now. Um, open space, we don't do a an, an ratio or anything like that with, with population just because it's such a um, opportunistic resource. You know, you take it whenever you can get it and you never know kind of when and where it's coming. Um, but the residents were definitely in support of securing additional open space. And we just encourage you to secure additional land when you can um, and to focus on expanding in your existing open spaces, um, preserving natural drainages, key habitat, um, other key natural resources. And then also helping to, you know, where it can connect your parks or neighborhoods and um, just other key destinations around the city. Uh, the plan also talks about potential unique uses for some open spaces where it's appropriate, um, you know, uses like archery ranges or fitness courses, things like that, that might be appropriate in certain areas if they're um, designed and located appropriately. If I could, I just wanted to make one correction. Lakewood Park actually has a sand volleyball court, and so that's down in Lake Mountain, so that actually puts us... Uh, uh, with one one meeting that standard and that was on page uh, 53 so I just noticed that as, as you mentioned that I'm like wait a second so if uh, we'll, we'll update that uh, and get a, a finalized version out okay great we'll make that update um, additional considerations for your park system uh, just ensuring that you um, establish and meet those minimum park standards uh, develop those specialty parks that residents uh, mentioned in the survey and in social pinpoint, um, upgrade any parks that have aged or, or lacking amenities, and then also um, implement a comprehensive wayfinding and signage master plan. Um, I just thought it was interesting when we were touring the parks with your staff, uh, some of the parks didn't even have names necessarily, or maybe people were calling them different things. So this is another opportunity for you guys to help brand yourself and really help Kind of reinforce your identity and promote all of these great facilities that you have so recreation you guys have a really extensive program uh, it was quite impressive <laughs> probably one of the most extensive programs we've seen in our recent projects um, the survey did uh, have a question about um, desired programs 
And you can see the most popular desired programs are highlighted in bold over there and include like fitness classes, art classes, um, some adult programs, uh, lacrosse, um, gymnastics, shooting classes, um, ultimate frisbee, those sorts of things. But just a little bit of feedback for your recreation programs to keep the interest high in the future. Um, and you guys do a, a great job on your community events. Obviously, they're very well attended. And again, that's the, the point of, of making sure that your parks will accommodate those in the future as you um, continue to grow these with your growing population. And again, you have uh, a really great arts you know, program and offering a variety of offerings. Um, so recommendations, uh, maybe conducting a feasibility study in the future, looking at some sort of a flexible use facility that could accommodate not only some of these recreation needs and desires, but also um, have some flexible space inside that could be used to accommodate arts or senior programs or just general community needs. Um, we recommend exploring partnership for the construction of these facilities. And that could be you know, with a private company, it could be with surrounding communities, you know, there are several um, several um, districts around the state recreation districts that are that serve multiple communities, and so that's a that's a good way to to partner up to pay for these high dollar facilities if it's possible, um, and then just again planning for that community event infrastructure. Looking at your existing trail system. You have over 30 acres of, or 30 miles of existing paved trails, over five miles of unpaved trails, over 11 miles of bike lanes, and over four miles of motorized trails. This map shows your existing trails within the city. Um, and here are the existing bike lanes. So the, the proposed system is really detailed <laughs> and it tries to take advantage of, again, a lot of those natural drainages that would probably, hopefully, um, fall within open space corridors that can connect your residential areas to your foothills and other key resources within your community. And there are a number of proposed trailheads that are shown in red on this plan as well. Mayor and Council, all that purple there are uh, paved street adjacent trails. So those would align with a lot of the development of our roads as, as they come in. Yeah. So this, this plan proposes over 127 miles of paved trails, 14.6 uh, miles of unpaved trails, and uh, over 56 miles of bike lanes. Um, and again, this is a pretty conceptual. So this is, you know, definitely maybe alignments to target and shoot for, but obviously, you know, things will change as, as developments come in and as opportunities arise. Um, this is the proposed bike lane network. Um, again, showing some of those, those key alignments. So in, in a lot of these cases, you would have a bike lane on a roadway, but then you would also have a, a paved street adjacent on a lot of these alignments. This map just shows the distribution of trailheads within the city. And um, I think we applied a half mile buffer to the trailhead areas and then um, a quarter mile to the trails just to kind of see if there were any areas in the city that didn't have a trail or a trailhead um, nearby. And that doesn't mean you can necessarily access the trail at every point along these trail routes, of course, but um, oftentimes you can just hop on a trail midpoint or, or certain areas where the trail crosses the street. The trail or the plan also includes uh, trail standards. So this details out by trail type, what the width would be, what the materials would be, um, what the maximum grade would be, and what the user groups, allowed user groups would be. And it includes diagrams of what those trail corridors would look like. And then it also details out trailhead standards. Um, so for each of these trailhead types, it talks, you know, gives recommendations on the number of parking stalls, the type of parking, um, what sort of amenities would, would likely occur at those trailheads. Um, 
And then the plan also details for all of those proposed trailheads that were on that trails map that the plan details what class of uh, trailhead it would be and, and the amenities and the user groups, just so you have detailed information. Uh, just can, can we go back to the last slide real quick? Sure. Um, I'm looking at Reformation Canyon mm -hmm. um, and the, the class one equestrian motorized, those, those two don't get along well together. I mean, you, we'd, you'd have to either have an equestrian trail or a motorized trail. You can't usually, motorbikes and, and horses don't get along. Okay. Um, so um, I'm just, I, I, I'm wondering, is that like a open designation of like one or the other, or is that, is it envisioning both? The, yeah, I think it, it could go either way. It's not saying you have to have both. It's just saying, you know, that this, it's envisioned to be able to accommodate like vehicles with trailers. And so, you know, you would need to designate, you know, whether it's one or the other. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, so some additional trail recommendations exploring the feasibility of user specific trails like maybe you have some trails that are bike only and, and some of those could be directional, you know, like some of the more complex mountain biking systems in uh, Corner Canyon or Park City, those sorts of systems. Again, wayfinding and signage for trails, um, specifying the use and regulations so that people aren't encountering users they're not <laughs> anticipating on trails, so, you know, help reduce some of your user conflicts. Um, and assist with uh, enforcement and regulation. And then just so, again, so people know the extensive network that you're hoping to build. Um, once that gets in place, it, it's great to let everybody know what the options are. And then uh, conducting a separate detailed study um, for the motorized trail use within the community, because this is, you know, a, a kind of a unique animal in and of itself. And, and it, I think it warrants a separate study just to look at that issue specifically. Uh, we, so we summarize the costs for all of these recommended improvements. This table summarizes the costs for parks. So this is upgrading your existing parks and helping meet those amenity um, service levels, um, filling your existing gaps, meeting needs by 2030, and then meeting needs by build out in 2060. Um, and you can see there are some zeros on the probable cost and those account for some of those uh, parks that are assumed to be provided by developers or, or some of those. So that's just over 48 million for the parks component. And then trails. Um, this doesn't include a cost for bike lanes because we assume that those are developed, those are kind of built in with the costs of road improvements. But this does include the cost for proposed paved trails, unpaved trails, um, lighting and safety improvements, you know maybe at trailheads or along certain segments of trails, and then new trailheads. And you can see the cost for that is um, just over 76 million. And so uh, adding those together um, comes to over $125 million. And again, some of these other, some of these proposed, other proposed parks could be provided by developers. You know, if you can work out those agreements, like we have 7.5 million for three five acre neighborhood parks. And if you can get those to come in, you know, as some sort of a, you know, part of a development agreement, that would be great. Um, this is kind of the worst case scenario, I guess. Um, so this total also includes the wayfinding and signage uh, master plan and installation. So you can see those costs there. Um, so just over 125 million. And then one other item that we do recommend is um, an annual budget for amenity replacement over time. And this is just so that you don't run into issues with deferred maintenance, like uh, playground equipment that is, um, you know, breaking or parking lots that need to be uh, resurfaced. And if you don't have budget item for those, just, just this is just kind of a backup fund to help help you save up to cover some of those, those costs that can arise over time, um, just so that you maintain your existing parks because, you know, people, People are generally happy with what you have, but it's it's good to make sure you maintain that into the future. How how did you arrive at that number? Just I'm just wondering because you know as we add an, a future park, uh, we're going to you know we're going to add amenities that then we'll, I mean I'm envisioning this kind of like our fleet replacement where we're paying paying it forward so that we can buy a car in five years when we need to replace the vehicle. 
Um, so what what percentage are you using of the current amenities so that we know, you know, if we add a new park, how much to, if we were gonna do this, how much to bump it up? Yeah, so what we did, I think we took, um, I wanna say 5% of the, of the proposed park improvements and then divided that out over the um, 40 lifetime. Uh, yeah, okay. over the 40 years. And so, it, I mean, there's a lot of, there are a lot of different ways you can come up with this number. This was just kind of trying to get a placeholder to start with. Um, Lisa, and, that's, that's fine. I just, I was just interested how you got to that number. So we, you know, if we decided to go that direction, we would know how to adjust it in the future. Lisa, yeah. on that note, could we just add in, in the plan itself kind of a brief overview of, how we come to that calculation for that very purpose so in the future we can you know calculate it further with additional amenities that come on yeah and it is it is uh described in the plan how how we we do arrive at that number and um and like i said you can uh, you can change that up any way you want to like some cities have a detailed plan of how many playgrounds they have and how often they're going to replace them and that way they can calculate out um you know how much money they need to save up you know every year in order to be able to pay for those like if they have a playground come up every five years then they they divide out that cost over five years and so, so lisa this this is mark isn't that an annual cost though so it's a little misleading to add it in that list it makes it look like it's a one-time purchase cost it isn't actually added into the list it's just an add-on to the total so well Oh, okay. I thought that list that I was looking at the chart had a total at the end. Yeah, no. It's total. so the, the, the total for the parks and trails is 125 million. And then this is just saying that annually you should target this number to, to start with. And then okay. you can just make adjustments as needed. Mayor and Council, if I could, I, I just want to point out that we already have money set aside for that in the parks budget. So Rick already has like 57,000 that's just for parks equipment. Um, and that's an annual budget appropriation that he's got. And then he's also got additional, uh, you know, almost $100,000 for, for, you know, um, additional expenditures in his parks budget. So although, um, you know, I trust me, I, I love the 137 number. We are already representing that in our current operating budget. And as our parks continue to grow, we'll continue to add to that as far as in, in essence, what they're suggesting is, is we have an asset management system. We track those. We already have that system in place. It's it's shared in our um, in our parks dashboard, um, and we are we are currently budgeting for that within our parks and open space department budget. So, um, you're you're on the right track. We're, we're we're there. We're already doing it to some extent. I don't know that I hit that number exactly, uh, but but Rick has more than adequate resources right now available to maintain those types of things. Maybe we should put a note of that in in the report, though. That I mean. Because if this is a recommendation, if I'm a resident, I'm just reading the report. I'm going to think, oh, well, the city's not not putting money away or not taking care of the maintenance of our parks. Well, and to, to Mark's point, it, it's in the operating budget, and so it's within our general fund operating budget. But yes, I think that that's a that's a great point to make sure that people understand that. And we can modify this text and just take out that number and put a note in there instead, and say, you know, that the city has this budget already and continues to right. wait and adjust that as needed in the future. I'd leave the number in the report, but just put a little uh, asterisk by that that says, you know, the, the city, um, the city is currently, um, you know, going to take care of these out of the existing parks budget or something like that. We'll find okay. some. For it. Okay, we can work on the language um, with you guys on that. Uh, so the plan takes all of these different action items that need to happen and um, places that on a timeline and shows, you know, what needs to happen in the immediate um, term, the short term, um, and then out to build out just so that you can help track, you know, what you should be working on right now and what you need to kind of keep in mind as you're moving forward. And then the plan ends with goals, policies, and implementations to help make sure um, that all of these um, targets are realized. Um, and like I said, they have they have specific policies and implementation measures. And if you know if there are any issues with any of those, we can certainly make adjustments.
And I think that's it. I had just one last comment. First, I think this is, Mayor, if I can make real quick, is that okay? You bet. Thanks. Um, I really appreciate all the effort and work that went into this. I mean, it's always a moving target. Um, one of the moving targets that happened is uh, we have a new council member. Um, so we need to update the beginning of the report since this is gonna be a 2020 report. Um, Shelly Barch is no longer a council member, but we have Chris Karn now. So if we could make sure and make a note of that to get that updated for this 2020 report, since that's the date it'll be on. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Any other comments? Perfect. Thank you for your time tonight to go over this. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the minutes. April 14th, 2020. I'll entertain a motion. I'll move approval of the minutes. I have a first from Councilman Wilden. Second. Second, Councilman Karn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. You're opposed? Okay. No, I, I, I was muted before. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, motion passes unanimously. We do have a need to enter into closed session this evening. Do you need to um, approve the ordinance that went along with the, the Parks oh. and Trail Master Plan? Yes, thank you for that catch. I will entertain a motion for the... Uh, uh I move Master to approve plan. item number five, uh, ordinance 20-17 dated today. Second. I'll second. Okay, I have a first from Councilman Podesca, second from Councilman McComber. Any further discussion? We need to add with the changes discussed. Yes. Oh, yeah, with the changes to uh, uh, the council member at the beginning, along with the asterisks that they'll work on wording with the staff on the annual upkeep amount. I'll amend my second. Okay, I amended first and second. Wilden? No, I was just giving a thumbs up. I was asking for your vote. Oh. Uh, <laughs> thumbs ups don't count for voting. Aye. <laughs> McComber? Aye. Deska? Aye. Karn? Aye. Porter? Aye. He's not used to, hasn't been on a plane in a while where they ask you on the exit row, you have to have a verbal answer. He's got to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, closed session, Mark. Um, we have to go to another link, don't we? We have another one. Yes, we do. We have a, uh, another link. <laughs> Sorry, look at Steve Wilden's picture. We have another link for the closed session. <laughs> what did he do? Uh, you look like you're surrounded by some great people, Steve. <laughs> uh, can I then make a recommendation, Mayor? Um, yes. It is recommended in my public attorney groups that we come back into this open meeting after the closed session. Correct. So we'll come back to this link. I'm not sure okay. how to work that out. But. So we're going to exit this, go to the other link, and then we'll all come back to this. Okay. So David Johnson needs to keep it going then. Do you stopping. need a motion to go into closed session? Hold I'll on. make yes, that if you need I, it. I do. I, I just need a little clarity. Yeah. So um are we is the meeting this meeting is resuming again after closed session yes, yes. we have to come back into this meeting to close the meeting out once we complete the closed session items so just po go ahead and post a, a note or share a screen or something that says um you know closed session uh, meeting will resume at the completion of the meeting. okay i'm gonna i gotta try and all right i will do my best I have to put up a word real quick. I'm just not sure I can pause the YouTube broadcast, um, but I will. That's okay. Just live stream the fact that we're in closed session. Live stream just that note. Okay. We'll do. Thanks. All right. Um, I made a motion to go into closed session. Sorry, we got a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. See you in closed session.
Motion to adjourn. Yep. <laughs> okay. Sorry, my audio wasn't clicking on. Nah. Okay. I'm going to change the motion to adjourn. Oh, we're done. Thanks, Chris everybody. Made it. For meeting tonight. Mayor Council, thank uh, you. Have a great evening. Uh, do we need to vote on this? No, no. he can. He uh, can close the meeting. See you. Perfect. Ya.